Hello everyone. This is Tim Bergsma, Metrum Research Group. We are back with day two of our sessions for chapter 11 for MI205. We're looking at advanced data assembly methodology. <clears throat> and we have a rather limited agenda today, and that is simply to go over the homework problems for the chapter, at least the, the exercises. I am monitoring the question box, so please leave me a question there if you so desire, or a general comment. And I see that we have questions about 5, 7, and 8 at very least, so we'll be sure to hit all of those. In fact, there may be some value in just going over all of them today. I think we'll certainly have time. <clears throat> if we have time remaining at the end of class, I will certainly hang around and take your questions about this chapter or any previous chapters, or you may already be working on your course project, and you may have questions about that as well. Any problems with audio or visual? You should see my screen at this point, and you should be able to hear me clearly. I am monitoring my microphone, and make sure I have, uh, I don't think I have an option there in choice of microphones. I think they're set correctly at this point, so we should be okay. Okay, I see confirmation on audio video, and I do have a confirmation that at least someone is interested in going over all the exercises. And since they do build on each other, I think that that might be the best strategy for this particular chapter. Let's go over all of the exercises. So uh, I'll just put these on screen again here so we can see exactly what we're dealing with. And I'll refer to this periodically. Let me move it to one side so I can click on it easily. That's good. Okay, so the first question says, for ID variable in listing 11.1, extract just the subject numbers. You recall that in the chapter material, we extracted the protocol identifiers. Now we're looking for subject numbers. We can do that. So I have a line of code here that, uh, you know what, I'll clear my R session here real quick, just so we know where we started. There. And we'll uh, take this line of code right here, and we'll run it. <clears throat> now we have these ID variables as an object in memory. And we want to get just the numeric portion out of those. I like to show it on the fly as a data frame, and now I'm not really creating any new objects. It's just another way to present the object we currently have. You can see how, once again, the lengths of the implied components of these character strings differ. We're going to create the splits of that vector, use the str split function, and id is the target here, dash is the split argument, that is the, uh, the character or string of characters that identifies the joining uh, component. We'll say fixed is true. In this case, I don't think you need to say fixed is true because in classic regular expressions, the dash doesn't mean anything in particular, I don't believe. Okay, we'll run this line of code and take a look at those splits. Now you see, once again, we have the protocols split out from the ID portion, the numeric ID portion of these elements. And now, <clears throat> let's see, a regular extraction. The assignment, once again, was to get, uh, extract just the subject numbers. So I think I've done this incorrectly here. Oh, you know what? I'm looking at the exercise we actually did in class. Didn't mean to do that. Apologies for the confusion. What I want to do is pull up this script, which does about the same thing, but pulls out the second part of each of those elements. Uh, and actually here it does it all in one step. So you see that instead of creating the ID object, um, 
necessarily, well, I did create the ID object, but then I just pass it in right here, <clears throat> and I do the do not create the string split object as I did in the lecture. Confusing? Let me slow it down and go back over it one more time. You see that in the lecture, this script is from Tuesday. I create this object called splits. You can do that. In fact, there's lots of ways you can do that. In the particular solution for the homework that I'm showing right now, I didn't bother to create the splits object. I'm just splitting on the fly. So like we saw before, I'm doing the split. I'm not bothering to specify fixed. And then I'm going to s apply across that result, which you have seen over here. And I'm going to element select just the second element of each result. So I'll run this piece of code. And you see we get back just the 1, the 35, and the 281, as we expected. Now, <clears throat> a methodological note as we go here, it's entirely up to you how elaborate you want these solutions to be. <clears throat> Generally, for these exercises, I make my solutions as compact as possible. And where I don't need to create secondary or intermediate objects, I don't. That might not always be the best way to proceed. Sometimes it's worth the extra effort to create intermediate objects, like the splits object, because it makes it clearer to yourself and clearer to your reader or reviewer just exactly what's going on. So if something I've done here is not clear, let me know and I'll slow it down and, uh, and show you in detail what's happening. But this is a fairly simple example. I think you can appreciate what actually happened there. As always, I'll post the script after the class is over and uh, you'll have it to look over at your leisure. But let's go ahead and look at exercise two right now. And that says for PK in the example code, impute missing pain scores using LOCF. LOCF, of course, is last object, last observation carried forward, sort of an industry standard term. That function is part of the Metromar G package. So let's make sure we have the Metromar G package loaded up. I don't see it loaded here. I'll go ahead and add a line. And now we have it loaded. And we're going to set seed to zero. In case you missed that, let me just show you why. Down here in the PK data frame, I make a call to our norm, which is a randomization function. It does random draws from the normal distribution. And I want my, my data that I construct here to look exactly like it looked in the book. Now, it doesn't have to, per se, but in this case, it's a convenience if they do match in case you're checking one against the other. So to achieve that result, I set my seed both in the book and right here in the exercises so that when randomization functions start to be called, they all start from the same place and give a constant result. Very often for, uh, for simulation in, in a in a live environment, you want to avoid setting the seed because you often don't want to get the same result every time. You want to get truly random results and uh, not artificially create constancy. And I am going to pause briefly here for a question. Someone's asking why I use double square brackets in the first example. That's a point worth going over. So let's hold off just a bit for question number two. And I'll, I'll set that problem up again in detail. Right now, let's back up into exercise one and talk about the double square brackets. So we have this object here called ID. It's a, it's a uh, well, let's check what class it is. Should it be character. Yes, it is a vector of class character. And you can do great things with vectors or anything that is list-like. One thing you can do is select particular elements of a vector, and that is the double square bracket. Double square brackets are element selectors. So we could just pull out that second element like this. And we get the middle element as you would have expected. 
you can also do this. You can select ranges of elements using single square brackets. This is the subset operator. For example, you could select elements 1 through 2 and you get just the first two elements. If you tried to select a range of elements with the element selector, you would get an error. <clears throat> you can't do that. The double square brackets let you select exactly one element. The single square brackets let you select one element or any number of elements as long as those indices are valid. So we could go back up to the subset operator, the single square brackets. We could have selected just number two. That's fine. But these are fundamentally different operations. In this particular case, the choice of double square brackets and single square brackets doesn't make a difference. You get the same result back because we are dealing with a vector as, as the target and we were only selecting one element anyway. So whether you think about it as selecting one element or subsetting the whole vector down to an element, the result is the same. Watch out though, because if you're dealing with a list, it makes a big difference whether you select a single element out of that list or whether you subset the list down to one element. I wonder, uh, wonder if we can show that with a simple example. Uh, maybe I'll risk it. I'll try Theof. Theof has a data frame. And a data frame is essentially one kind of a list. So you could do something like Theof and uh, take just the first element of the list. That ought to give us back the subject column. It does. But if you take Theof and use the subset operator and subset down to just the first element of it, then you get back something very different. You get back a very narrow data frame, which is actually one kind of list. You see, so there it's extremely consequential whether you use subset or element select, even though you're only talking about a single index. Beware the difference. This actually returns a data frame whereas the previous example with the double square brackets returns just a vector. Let's look again then at question number two. I'll watch the question box in case you need clarification for anything there. And we're just imputing pain scores using LOCF and we only, only need the PK data set right now. Well, I have code here that creates the dose data set as well as the PK data set. I'll just make them both in case I want them later, and I think I do run that block of code. Take a quick look, and we see we have dose here, and we have PK there, just like we did in the chapter. Here's our target here, and we want to do something with these pain scores. We want to use LOCF on the pain scores, and I have that here and we want to stratify, or if you will, nest the imputation within the subject. And I have that right here. And of course the pain is the object we're operating on. And the reason why I can just say pain and not say dollar pain is because I'm doing this within trick where I say within PK. And that makes all those columns available as though they were objects defined in some environment. So I'm just going to say reapply pain, where pain is x. And to make it clear, I could say index here is subject. And the function we're using is LOCF. And what the within function does is it takes a data frame, unpacks it, sets all those objects up for you to work with, and then you make some assignment or evaluation it's going to accept what you did and then try to repackage everything back into a data frame and return the whole thing. So although you might have said dollar pain set to dollar pain and changed the object, here we're not going to be changing the object at all. We're just going to 
create a variant of that data frame on the fly without assigning it anywhere. If that's confusing, well, let me know and I'll, I'll slow it down and do it another way. But I'll just source that line of code right now. And you see without actually altering the original PK object, we do have a variant of the data frame where uh, imputation has occurred. For example, you see this 3 now has been imputed. Let's make that bigger without looking at the help for right now. And you see this NA right here has not been imputed because it's a leading NA and we don't want anything dragging over from subject A into subject B. Any questions about this imputation for pain scores? Just gives you a little more, uh, a little more practice with stratified imputations. I'll show you a neat trick here. Suppose you really have to have all of pain defined because maybe it's a covariate or something and can never be missing. You could use something where you impute forwards and then backwards so that if you can't pick something up from a previous value, you could at least pick it up from a later value. So this imputes forwards and then backwards using a combination of last observation carried forward and then next observation carried backward. And what this guarantees is that if there's any score for pain at all, then there will be no NAs in the result. And of course that's happening within subject here because we're using reapply while we index by subject. Okay, well since I'm going to save this script and put it on the website, I better leave it the way it was assigned so you can refer to it later and, and get an equivalent result. Right now we're going to go ahead and look at question number three, or exercise number three, which says merge dose and PK from the example code dynamically creating a type variable that is either dose or PK respectively. I think we did something with EVID in the chapter material. Now we're going to create a type variable where we say dose or PK. And again, just because we can, we're going to create an object on the fly without actually assigning it anywhere. You could easily do this as well and get, get a completely valid result if you, uh, if you want to make these objects one, of, one at a time and then compose some third object which you name and display. That's fine. But I know that I have this data frame, which is ready to go. And I know that I have this data frame, which is also ready to go. And I'm going to transform those. Maybe I'll even put that all in one line for visual clarity. I'm going to transform those on the fly. So if I say transform dose, and I'm going to create a type variable, type equals dose. I can run that piece of code and see what the sub-result is. See my type variable is there. I'm going to merge that with PK doing the about the same thing but with a slightly different type value. You can see that partial result as well. When you merge them together saying all is true, you're going to get every record back. And the result is thus. Now in an actual production setting, you might want to sort these differently, although I kind of like how these are sorted by subject, time, and type. So that works well for me. And you see that uh, really the object, the idea of pain doesn't pertain in the dosing records. So that's why you have these structural NAs there. It's also worth a reminder that uh, this type thing could be a function of some other variable that's already present in the dosing data frame. We don't have anything that complicated as an exercise right now. It's just good to be aware that you could do some complex variable creation on the fly. Well, that's exercise three. Let that digest a bit. Feel free to, to uh, push me to expand on that if you like. We certainly have time for it today. And if you don't raise any issues, I'm going to move right on to question number four. And that question asks us to look at the data in listing 1110. And that used 
dose and pK from the example code. We already have that present in our memory. We're going to create an ignore flag that is true for positive concentration values that occur before the first dose, except where pain is not Na. You may have picked this up during the lecture on Tuesday. We were taking a data set something like this, and we were commenting out these leading records. Actually, I don't see them here. We'll probably actually have to recreate that data set. But we were coming out leading records of concentration where they were Na. I think uh, maybe it was something like this we were commenting out. But that was also hiding a valid pain score. Now, pain being PD value, you know, there might have been a baseline value of PD not directly related to dosing, and you may have wanted to include that in your data set, either for modeling purposes directly or for a covariate or something like that. Uh, so that might be suboptimal to be commenting out absolutely everything. So we'll look at some variants of how you might deal with that. In this case, we're going to say, wait a second, I'm missing something here. For number four, data from 1110, ignore flag, except where pain is not an A. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think this is fine. We're going to recreate that data set. This is exactly what we had in section 1110. Let's look at data now. There you go. And the in-chapter exercise had us commenting out this record and losing that pain score. Now we're saying, no, 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 whatever we do, let's please don't lose the pain score. So we're going to go within the data, and we're going to create this ignore flag within the data. And first we're going to make sure we're only dealing with concentrations that are specified. Because when you start to do logical vectors, like true-falses, where something is actually missing, and that can't be evaluated, you get NAs, and then the NAs propagate to the rest of your results. That's generally not what you want. So we're, we're protecting our evaluation of concentration by starting with a look at who is Na and who is not. So only where concentration is not Na, we're also testing that it's greater than zero. We don't really care about the zeros right now. They don't bother anybody. Concentration should be zero if there has been no dosing yet. The way we know there's been no dosing is because we are before some arbitrary criterion. In this case, before the first record, where EVID equals 1. Now, if it suited your purposes, you could test whether you were before the second record, or the third record, or even the last record where EVID was 1. Right now, we just want to go with the default before the first record where EVID equals 1. And we're going to nest that evaluation within subject, so we're not sharing information across subjects. And finally, this is what's new, we're going to ignore just those records where pain is Na. That is, if we hit a record where pain was actually defined, like here, we would say, no, we don't want to ignore that. But down here, this concentration is, well, that concentration is Na also. So you might, uh, I'm struggling to find an example here. I wonder if there is one where you have a defined concentration. Ah, well, no, that's on a, on a dosing record, isn't it? Let's just run the thing and take a look. Well, we did get one true here. Here's a particular record where you have a pre-dose concentration value that you might have wanted to ignore, and now we actually get to ignore it because we're not losing any pain information either. So there is a record like that, and that is a valid result. Again, you could have assigned this to an object and make the, uh, make the flag permanent. That's up to you. This particular example suffices. Any questions there about exercise number four? We move ahead then with exercise number five. For that same piece of data, in listing 1110, create an ignore, an ignore flag for doses that occur after the last sample. See, we really just flipped the question around. Instead of ignoring samples before the first dose, we're ignoring doses after the last sample. This is something you might want to do sometimes. If you are modeling 
um, dose response in non-MEMS say, well, you know, once you're done collecting PK observations, extra doses aren't going to influence the model parameters at all. So you might want to just ignore them, uh, drop them out of your data set, whatever. Or you could leave them in for, for your own review purposes. But here we're going to do the reverse of what we tried earlier. We're going to say within that same data, I can get away with that, by the way, because I haven't modified data yet. All these evaluations I've just been doing on the fly and not actually creating any new objects and not modifying data, just showing a different version of it. So now I can go within the data again. Once more, I'm creating an ignore flag. <clears throat> Here I'm testing, let's see, EVID equals 1. Ignore, oh, I'm ignoring EVID equals 1. Here I'm actually ignoring dosing records, right? And this is after EVID equals zero, which is a sample record by non-MEM convention. Again, the, the call to after is stratified within subject. And I want to ignore after not the first sample. I want to look after the last sample. So I use negative one to count samples from the back of the vector. Or in this case, it's just the partial vector that applies for any particular subject. So I say n equals minus 1 that starts coming from the back. That gives me the last effect. So I'm looking for records that are after the last sample record within subject. Now that's a lot. And this is about as compact as you can put that. So it might be confusing to see that all in such a short space. Feel free to break it out if it helps you make sense out of it. But you can look above and see that we used to be calculating our vertical criterion using the doses. Now we're looking at the samples and actually ignoring doses, which is a little bit of a reversal. Let's run that and see how it shows up on screen. And you see that, in fact, there is a case right here in subject B, subject B had uh, what for a whole record? Starting here, we had a, a sample, sample, then a first dose, and then a sample, sample, and then a last dose, and then no more further sampling. So we're just going to ignore that last dose because it really doesn't impact our, our PK modeling at all. Any questions about that? Very good. We're going to move ahead then with exercise number six. Exercise number six asks us to convert the data in listing 1115 so that subject is a column level distinction in sit, stand, systolic, diastolic, our row level distinctions. I think there are only were three things that we could interconvert in listing 1115. And this is the only one we didn't try in the chapter material. So let's go ahead and try it now as an exercise. Just for review, the data we're working with here is a data frame I'll call A. And this time I'm actually going to show you A. Just to refresh your memory, how it looks. Again, you could have done this all on the fly by putting the whole data frame specification right here. That really would get ugly and truly obscure our purposes here. So it makes sense to create the intermediate object. And we're going to go ahead and melt that object. Before I show you the complete result, let's just do the melting portion. You know how melt and cast often work together. Don't have to. You could certainly melt a data frame and do nothing else with it, except perhaps plot it or something. But we're going to melt it first, and since the melt is so easy, we embed that melt call right in the call to cast. You see that the melt takes all the observation values, all the numeric stuff here, and stacks it into a single vector. We have uh, sit-stand classifiers, we have systolic-diastolic classifiers, and we have subject classifiers. And it looks like uh, these all occur as a group, as 
systolic is, is going all systolics than all diastolics. They're varying slowest. These are varying, subject is varying next slowest, and position is varying fastest as these columns go. Now our challenge, once again, was to convert this so that subject is column level distinction. I don't know why you'd want to do this, but the question is asking us to have one column for each subject. Then everything else is going to be a flag, if you will. Well, we can do that. Let's say position is going to be a row level distinction. Variable is going to be a row level distinction. We'll add those together for row levels. Then we throw in our tilde and specify our only column level distinction. Of course, you don't need to say anything about value. That's implied. Cast has to work with the values. And if it can't find a value column, it'll complain, it'll guess, or it'll ask you. I think in, in earlier, sorry, later versions of Cast, you can even specify some other column to hold your values. But right now, we'll just show the whole transformation on the fly and make sure we understand the result. So, as before, when the melt occurred, the reshape package took a guess about what you wanted to use as ID variables. It's using subject and position. That was a good guess, and we liked it before. Now we're doing the cast as well. You see position is still a column. Variable is still a column. But now the subject column has been unstacked to make two new columns using those subject values. And here you see the original eight values rearranged with columns for subject. Perfect. Any questions about melt or cast? Very powerful in combination, a good skill to learn. And if we're lucky, we'll have some more examples later in these exercises. Yes, I see we do coming up in exercise seven. I see a question in, in my chat box. How did you know to define SBP and DBP as variable? Yes, good question. And here it might be useful to just do the melt as an independent step. Let's say um, M set to melt A. Let's show M. Now, I may be misunderstanding your question, but I'll make my, my best try at it, and you can clarify. I think you're talking about when I write the equation that, sorry, when I write the formula that cast expects, how do I know to call this variable? If that's your question, what it is is I'm looking back here at my data frame, my melted data frame, and I'm seeing that ah, variable is actually the column name for this thing. Yeah, that's, that's your question, and now we, now we have clarity here. Yeah, it's not immediately obvious when you express it this way because we haven't peeked at the result of melt yet. But if you do stop and look at melt, I kind of knew in advance that melt will always create a variable column unless I tell it to do something else. And I know I'm belaboring this, but it's worth a quick peek now at the help for melt. And let's see for melt data frame, we'll, we'll check on that. Ah, here, here's where it actually happens. In recent versions of the reshape package, this is where it gets specified that when melt has to create a column, it's going to call it variable. However, if you'd like it to be something else, like um, pressure type, you know, for blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, you could give an inform informative name for that column by specifying this argument to melt. That's a nice trick, and it's often very useful to, uh, to make highly informative molten objects if you're uh, writing a lot of code and don't want to stop and have to do all these column renames on the fly. i sorry, in between various steps. Please take a look at the help if you get into a situation where that would be useful. I think I expanded that the wrong way. We're back into our regular data frame. 
and we're looking for exercise number seven. We're looking at the data in listing 1110 again, combining concentration and pain into a single column. Hey, we have an easy way to do that. That would be a melt. Then we're going to sort that result on subject time and EVID. This is like a classic data assembly project now. And then we're going to create an ignore flag for concentration values that occur before the first dose. See what's going on here? Earlier exercises, we were forced to choose between either accidentally commenting out some good pain values or letting some uh, bad concentration values sit there just so that we didn't lose good pain values. Now this particular exercise gets around that. It says, hey, let's take all those pain and concentration values and make them all separate rows. Then we can, with great precision, comment out just the observations that we're worried about and leave all the other ones untouched. So there's a method to the madness here, and I'll show you the methodological approach for the code itself right here. We're going to actually melt that data, remind us what it is, and this time we're going to create a new object. We'll call it molten. The measure, var measure variables are going to be concentration and pain. Here I'm actually specifying what the measure variables are. I'm not going to let melt guess because melt is going to look at anything numeric and treat that as an observation. And here all my flags are numeric just by accident and that would be wrong. I only want to stack the concentration and the pain here. So we'll run that and take a quick look at molten. And you see we have now a new flag. By default it's called variable. We could call it type or domain or something like that. And now all these observations are stacked and we can, con we can comment out just the concentration ones that bother us without losing any pain scores. Now the assignment again said create an ignore flag for concentration values only that occur before the first dose. We're just going to leave all the pain scores the way they are. We're going to go back what we used to do what we used to do with the concentrations. We're going to say within molten down here ignore here we're not actually doing some action, we're just creating an object called ignore that becomes a column in our data set. And the criterion for that ignore is variable equals concentration. The secondary criterion is that those variables must be before the first dose record or before those places where EVID equals 1 and as usual we're nesting within the subject. Let's make sure that corresponds to our assignment. Yeah, in the assignment it doesn't care at all whether they're NA. It's just going to get rid of all of them. We're not testing for NA or zero or whatever. All we know is that they are concentration records and that they are before the first subject. So we'll go ahead and do that. We know, of course, that variable is always defined. There are no NAs. So we don't have to worry about protecting that evaluation with a call to is NA. We can just go ahead and test directly whether they're concentration. Let's run that code snippet. We see the result. We have our ignore flag over here. So you can see right here We've got uh, an ignore flag for this concentration. We see indeed it is EVID zero. It's before the first dose. And I was thinking to myself, how do we know we're only ignoring concentration values and not accidentally ignoring dosing values? Well, a dose value could never be before itself. So the first dose value is fine and all subsequent dose and concentration values are fine. So we know we're only ignoring non-dose values here. And those would be our concentrations or possibly our pain scores. And you see that the ones that are ignored are always of type concentration. There's one, there's one, and that may be it for the rest of the data frame. So this result looks pretty good. If you have a question about it, I'd be happy to entertain it.
at this point, or we can come back to it if you want to think about it for a few minutes. We do have one additional exercise to look at, and that says for the PK in the example code, drop the pain scores and arrange the concentration values using a separate column for each time. That integrates several of the techniques we learned in this chapter. Let's take a look at a possible solution on screen. Okay, so reminding us what the PK data frame looks like. Seems we haven't modified it since we created it. We should be good. And we're going to drop the pain scores. You know what? One way to do that would be if you just come right here and say PK pain set to null. That's the classic way to do it. And now if you look at PK, pain scores are gone. Now what I've done in the code off to the left here is to drop those pain scores implicitly. Let me tell you what happened here. You see this call to melt? I'm melting the PK data set and I'm explicitly saying what my measure variables are, that's concentration, and I'm explicitly saying what my ID variables are, that's subject in time. And if you specify all of those, then melt does no guessing and it doesn't care about anything else. All it wants are your ID variables and your measure variables, and melt will drop pain if you don't bother mentioning it anywhere. So just to prove that's true, I'm going to put pain back on. And instead of creating values, I'll just make a column for it. And we'll go ahead and do just the, the melt part of this one-liner. I think we probably need an extra parentheses there. We'll run just that portion of it. And you see that pain is gone. It wasn't an ID variable. It wasn't a measure variable. So it's just left out of the picture. And we have a molten data frame now, which has just concentration variables and uh, with subject and time flags. Now, you know what? At this point, you really don't even need the concentration uh, flag anymore. We don't need the variable column because it's constant. It's not informative. So if you're doing this stepwise, you could even drop that column for clarity. It only ever has one value. But we're just going to uh, leave it there because, once again, the cast call, the call to cast, is going to look at your formula and if you don't specify variable on the left or right, then it becomes irrelevant. Cast is only concerned about the column level distinctions you specify and the row level distinctions you specify and will implicitly drop everything else. Completely analogous to melt, only caring about your measure of errors and your ID errors. So let's go ahead and do the whole thing in one pass. Just for clarity, I'm looking at this formula and I'm saying that subject is going to be a row level distinction and I'm going to have a column level distinction for time. So unique columns for each time. And hopefully that corresponds to exactly what we said in exercise 8. It says yes using a separate column for each time. So let's rearrange those pain, those uh, concentration scores. And we'll do it all in one pass. And here you see that you do have subject A, B, and C. And you do have times 0, 1, 2, and 3. This is sort of like a time series look at things. It might work well as a matrix if you're doing some fancy matrix math. It does work well as an object here only because you have very balanced data. That is, every subject has every time, has an observation at every time point. It could start to get look, could look really ragged if you had times at varying across subject. Then you'd have a column for every unique time and you'd have a lot of holes. Say if 
subject A had a measurement at time four and subject B did not. <clears throat> but this is okay for, for now. I don't know how you'd use this in a production setting for PK modeling or analysis, but uh, it's at least instructive and it's an opportunity one more time to try out our skills using MILT and CAST. And that's a good enough reason for the attempt. Well, I see that we've used most of our allotted time for these exercises. We do still have a few minutes left in the clock before the top of the hour. And I'm just going to hang out here and take your questions. You are free to use your time as best you see. and. Uh, if you need to log off and go work on your project or something else, that's great. Otherwise, feel free to stay around and talk to me about your project or these exercises or some other aspect of the course. I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Thanks all, and we'll see you back here for your next lecture on Tuesday, I believe, unless I've got the calendar mistaken. I do see a question from someone saying, can you show how to add indicator variable compartment at step seven? So let's say, uh, do you mean exercise seven? Okay, so let's repeat exercise seven and add an indicator variable like compartment. Okay, let's see. <laughs> okay. So we did this thing here where we said uh, molten. I'm going to recreate that. Take a look at molten. Wow, that's huge. Okay. Variable conch pain. Yeah, that's a great candidate for a compartment variable. Um, the pain compartment or the concentration compartment. So what I would do, this is an excellent question by the way, thanks for asking it. Uh, we're gonna say, <laughs> here we had this call to uh, within, we do molten. Hmm. Uh, you know where we're going to do it? It's, it's, the magic is all in the melt step right here. So instead of doing this melt data with measure var, var only, we're going to say comma variable name equals compartment. I think that's it. Let's say head molten. There, now you've got your compartment identifier ready to go. The only problem here is that compartment is still character. And I don't know, it depends on the tool you're using, that may be fine if you're modeling in R. If you're modeling in non-mem, you'd have to convert that to a number. So how could you do that? Well, you could do that um, one of several ways. Actually, you can't do it ahead of time because in the underlying data you see that concentration and pain, those words, are column names. Uh, actually, I take that back. You can use numbers for column names, but R is going to treat them as though they are character representations of those numbers. That gets really ugly. So the right time to fix those conch and pain things and make them actual numbers is now, after you've done the melt. So we'll say head molten right over here. Run that. And we're going to now say something like this. Uh, molten compartment set to map. And we're going to map molten compartment. Start with what we started with. We're going to say from. And here we're going to give a list of values we know occur.
And now we're going to give a list of values in the corresponding order that we want to use. And here you could use anything. I'll just say compartments 1 and 2 as a default. And we've simply mapped from these values to those values, just doing a one-for-one one replacement. And say head of molten again. And you see now that wherever we had concentrations, we have ones. And we could look at all of molten and see that we've mapped the pain compartment as well to numeric 2. And the, the, uh, the class of this vector now is going to be the class of the 2 argument. And these are real numbers, not just character representations of numbers. So that works very well in R or also for non-mem. I see another chain of related questions. Different compartments for dose, concentration, and pain. Compartment, compartment, card. Oh, that's, let me see how that works out. Oh. That's a very good point. Because here I have a compartment. Let's see, why do I do this? Hmm, that's more complex. We did get the compartments mostly right for, uh, for concentration and pain, but you have a very good point. You do need a separate compartment for dose. Excellent point. You need three compartments. Absolutely. My mistake. So I wonder if uh, there's a way to back out of this code and fix that. Hmm. Not really. I mean, the easiest fix is just to come in here and say something like this. And of course, maybe these numbers are not ideal. You might want dose to be compartment one, but you'll know how to fix that. Let's just take molten compartment and, and look everywhere that mol, molten EVID equals one. Those are the values we need to fix. And we could simply set them to 3. Now we look at molten again. And you see now we have three distinct compartment numbers. And everywhere we had a dose, we now have compartment 3. And no value over here. So. Ideally, you know, that's a great question, and ideally, I don't like to do these after-the-fact fixes. Because you see, what I did was somehow I accidentally created compartment values for dosing records, and it would have been far preferable to never, rather than just fixing that after the fact, to never have created those incorrect values in the first place. So ideally, we want to think about this problem from a, a data theoretic point of view and say, how can we avoid accidentally creating those values in the first place? That would be worth the effort because in general it's better not to create a problem than to simply know how to fix it. So I'll go ahead and think about that. If I don't see any other questions, maybe I'll, I'll think of an obvious solution as I sit here. But uh, otherwise, feel free to pursue it with me offline, maybe through the uh, the messaging uh, mechanism on the course site. I will say this, I think the problem starts back here with data. Because data is already a hybrid sort of sort of object here. I think what we might want to do is pull the EVID0 records out from the EVID1 records right here and then do our melt just on the EVID0s. That might be the right way to pursue this.
Yes, do you see there's an error here, really? Because when we did our melt, we had these two observations, we had this dosing record still in here for our concentration pain melt. And we were treating this as Na concentration and Na pain. And the reshape package says, well, fine, I can melt those observations for you. But in fact, they are not, uh, they are not explicit. They are not informational observations of concentration and pain. Those are merely structural NAs. Those are just placeholders. And they don't belong in the melt at all if we're just trying to stack our, our PKPD there. So, and a consequence of that, if you look for subject A, you see that we now have two dosing records at time zero. EVID one there, one for concentration and one for pain right here. And that is an error. So in a production environment, you would definitely want to slow down and <clears throat> stack those concentration and pain scores independently of the dose records. In other words, do the stack before you merge dose and PK. That would be the correct way to handle this problem. And then you'd have a chance to specify compartment for the dosing records on the fly using exactly the same methodology we used back in exercise three. You'd say compartment right here. When you're transforming dose, you would say, well, you could say type equals dose. You could also say compartment equals three, or whatever you want it to be. And that would be the correct way to handle exactly this problem. I see two more questions on screen, so I'm going to keep talking. We'll let the recording run a little longer here. What is ASCEED? ASCEED is a wonderful, powerful little tool for, uh, for augmenting your data frames. So let me see if I can think of an example here. Let's say um, dose. Do we have something like that here? Yeah. Let me say uh, STR dose. Okay, you see right here we have a dosing data frame. And it has uh, three columns, subject, time, amount. Really what this dosing data frame is trying to convey or communicate is observations of amount. And those amount observations uh, are, are distinct. Even though 40 here and 40 here are the same value. There's a good reason why we have it in here twice. Because one dose was given at time zero and one dose was given at time two. So those are unique observations. And the way we completely distinguish them from each other is by the column subject and time. So we know we're talking about subject A and time zero and two. So in fact, we can completely distinguish these observations from each other only knowing subject and time. We call subject and time the key for this data frame. So the way to, to capture that explicitly using R is like this. You could say, let's make up a, something called keyed dose. We can say keyed dose is as keyed dose. We're making a keyed version of dose and we're going to say that the key is subject or a combination of subject and time. In other words, when we key an object, we specify the key. We tell which columns are required to completely identify or completely distinguish the various observation records from each other. Now we can say, uh, we'll display key to dose. That is not going to be surprising. It looks exactly like the prior version, except there are a great set of tools such as summary, which instead of giving you an exhaustive account of all the values in those columns, is simply going to check whether your keys are good. And here, it tells explicitly what your key is. This says is this data set is keyed on subject by time. 
don't worry too much about the tilde there. It's not really the, a formulaic tilde. It's just a separator for these column identifiers. You see that we have no missing keys, which is very important to know if you're doing data assembly. And you see we also have no duplicate keys. If we ended up having some duplicate keys here, we should be worried because that would be telling us that we have not adequately distinguished these, uh, these observations from each other. For example, let's back up here and let's miskey this data set. We'll say just keying it on subject. And then if we say summary of that, we say, uh-oh, yeah, all your subjects are specified, so you have no missing keys, but you have six duplicates. Then we scratch our head and say, why do we have all those duplicates? We go back and look and find out that, oh yeah, of course. You really require time as part of your key to uniquely identify all those observations. So at that point, we could go back. You could also do something like this, keyed dose set to, and I'm pretty sure that we reverse the record order here. Maybe it only reverses the column order if you say rev. Let's try it. Uh, sorry about that. All we've done is reverse the uh, reverse the column order. I didn't want to do that. What I wanted to do is something like this, where we say, what are there? Only six rows here. So let's say keyed dose is set to uh, keyed dose. But let's take rows six through one instead of rows one through six. Now you see that we have subject C way out ahead of subject A, and you have all your times backwards as well. That can be ugly. It's often much easier to work with data if it's sorted in a predictable way. And so what we're going to do here is sort it. The nice thing is that uh, if we already know the key of this data frame, Ah, oh, that's wrong, isn't it? Let's say that the, the set the key arbitrarily to something better here. This is another way to do it. There we go. Let's do a summary of that. We say that we've got a great set of keys there, and there are no duplicates, no NAs. But notice that this particular data frame is unsorted. And the easiest way to deal with that is to say sort keyed dose, and you get the result that you might expect. You don't have to worry about saying order and then listing a whole bunch of factors. The function sort knows that for a keyed object, it should go in and look at the keys, find those columns, and then sort starting with the first one and nest the remaining underneath that. So a very powerful little set of tools for, for working explicitly with keys that are usually left implicit. Happy to go a little over today. I have a question. Can you talk a little bit about the con conch simulation using what dose r norm 12? Yeah, let's take a look at that code back there. Okay, I think you're talking about, uh, if I look at my dose data frame, I don't see any R norms in there. That's all static data. But I do see that in this PK data frame that we, uh, we made up a subject and we made up some times, but uh, we had this call to R norm in there. Okay, so let's just take a look at that on the side. If we say um, R norm, 12, what we're going to get is 12 draws from the normal distribution where mean is 0 and standard deviation is 1. So we know we needed 12 values because we had 12 records in this data set. That's why I say R norm 12. 
And then what I did was I added two to each of those to displace my mean somewhat north of where these values are. And then signif, the call to signif, simply limits these to a couple of places of significance, two in this instance. So if we do the whole expression like this, we get some values that are easier to look at. And I'm warning you that if you do it several times, you get different sets of values over and over. That's why we do the set seed up here to get a result back like we had it in the book. I'm trying to keep up with the questions here. I see, uh, oh, backing up to the question about keys. Yes, the sequence of keys is very important. Bear in mind that the order that the keys occur in the data frame, that's up to you. And it's irrelevant as far as the sorting is concerned. But for purposes of sorting, yes, the, the sequence of keys is very important. And uh, what I meant is this, I see a comment. What I meant is the sorting priority will give to subject first and then time since subject is in front of time. Yes, that is correct. Sorting priority is by subject first and then time. That is exactly correct. You are welcome. So we're bouncing around just a little bit there. I hope we got to all the questions about our norm and about keyed. Be happy to clarify. Sorry for uh, dodging back and forth. It's kind of hard to watch the question box grow as we do things on screen. But uh, I think that should cover it. Let me know if we haven't. You know, I will say this about our norm. You see, I, I did our norm 12 plus 2. Instead of saying plus two, I could have just said R norm 12 comma two, and that would have given me a default mean of two instead of zero. That probably gives exactly the same result. We could test it by controlling the seed and trying it a couple of different ways. I see the thank you, and you are quite welcome. I'm going to go ahead and shut down the meeting at this point. I'll, uh, I'll close off the recording. I'll fix up the script. I'll post it on our course webpage. And then you'll have both the recording and the script to look at. And of course, you may also ask, feel free to ask me questions through the forums on the course webpage. Thank you all. I'll see you here next Tuesday.